All right, man, this is episode number 83 of the Cozy Corner of Cinema. This is being recorded on Monday, October 30th, 2023 at 4.19 p.m. It is Halloween Eve. There's a cloudy overcast in the air with the dead leaves resting on the ground. The trees are somewhat hollowed as those few leaves that are still alive hang on for dear life, man. It's been raining all day. It really just kind of stopped around an hour or so ago. It's kind of drizzling now, but it's not really too bad, you know. I had to run to the store really quick and only had to put my uh, windshield wipers on a couple of times to store for down the street, so it wasn't too bad. But definitely just, if you're out there, man, there's, uh, you know, it's raining and all that, just be careful on the road. If you're making a sharp turn or something, next thing you know, you know, your tires be crapping out on you because of the wet roads. Anything can happen, so just be cautious out there, man. Uh, But yes, like I said, Halloween Eve. Halloween is tomorrow, so I hope you are getting in the festive spirit, taking in plenty of appropriate cinema, literature, listening listening to uh, uh, Halloween music, you know, songs, or just maybe you like to listen to film scores, you know, put on some like Tangerine Dream or John Carpenter or any kind of film scores really like that, composers, a goblin, you know, all that good stuff, uh, you know, uh, Riz Ortolani, just kind of get yourself in the spirit. And uh, yeah, it's been quite a busy a uh, week or so, man. It's been very, very busy. It's been, uh, you know, trying to get this 1993 uh, prep going. I still have about a handful. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Two, four, six, eight. I'm sorry, eight. I have eight more films. Actually, no, nine, because I have another one in the other room that I have to watch before I can even begin recording the 1993 episode. So it's been quite hectic. So as much as I would like to use the time tomorrow to watch some seasonally appropriate films. I don't know if seasonally is a word or not, but as much as I like to do that, I just have too much to do in that regard. Plenty of writing has to be accomplished. I have a deadline that I will see if I can even make this week. It happened the other week. I had a deadline that, unfortunately, I was just not able to make because I was writing and it just was not coming together and I had two options. That was to rush to a conclusion or just cut my losses and use that experience to further other writing and I took the latter option on that but I have another deadline that I would like to uh, achieve but whether or not it happens only time will tell. Quite literally only time will tell. Uh, Time is so important and it's so important to... um, use correctly or use in the way that you see fit. There is no right or wrong way to use your time, only in the way that you see fit. So just keep that in mind going forward. So let me get this right here. Uh, I recently was talking about the uh, Sam Peckinpah book written by David Weddle from 1990. four or five, if they move, kill them, and I uh, just finished it within the past week. Um, It was a little under 600 pages, and it was one of uh, the strongest, most enjoyable books I've read this year overall. It goes up to uh, his his, uh, up-and-coming life as a filmmaker, his uh, troubled life, his relationships with his women and his family, uh, and his crippling well, at times crippling alcoholism, when he was focused and straight and narrowed, he would really be, uh, you know, up to bad and just really be focused. But uh, more times than not, he uh, became distracted, became of, uh, became distracted by many vices that would ultimately cripple him in his career. But in the process, still be making terrific films. And it really, it goes through uh, most of his films in in great depth. I would say if I had any sort of criticism, which is uh, something that the book does bring up, is that um, I would say up to a certain point, it's very, it's a good um, perspective and look at each of his films up until a certain point. Let me pull up his filmography here. But I think around the time uh, that the book gets to The Killer Elite with James Caan is when it it kind of rushes through to the conclusion. Because at that point, you still have uh, a handful of films that you have to get through if you're looking through his filmography because you have um, The Killer Elite, and then you have... um, I'm sorry, actually, even before that... I'm sorry, I thought this film was after, but it actually was this film before. So uh, Bring the Head of Alfredo Alfredo Garcia, which is one of his very best films and one of my favorite films. The book does... uh, 
go by that very quickly. Um, questionably so, because that is a uh, controversial film, but it's also considered to be one of his very best. Um, it's always in the conversation of great Peckinpah films or great Warren Oates films, and I actually have a poster for that in the other room, so it's a shame that they kind of rushed through that, as well as The Killer Elite, Cross of Iron, Convoy, and uh, the Austrian Weekend, as well as it mentions briefly his real final work, which was the Julian uh, Lennon music videos, which I have just realized until now I forgot to watch, so those will be watched at some point. But um, the book does mention another book that I am blanking on the name of that um, I think this might be the one, A Portrait and Mo- Montage. I think this is the one that it mentioned where it says that it goes into more depth with some of the other films, so it might have to be read at some point as well. Because he was a filmmaker who even by the end, you know, from after he has made multiple comebacks and really kind of proven the people wrong, it was sort of like he became uh, he became reliant on his uh, vices that oftentimes it would get in the way of his uh, his filmmaking ability his dealing with uh, you know the studio heads and the producers. It's sort of like a one-man army, but you know what are you really fighting for? You know, it's a true kind of rebel without a real cause, uh, at least and not uh, entirely or so, because you know they talk about how he was worried about his films being taken away from him and stuff, and sometimes that happened, and sometimes they very clearly screwed him over. But ultimately, I think that even in a case like uh, Pat Garrett, Billy the Kid, or bringing the head of Alfredo Garcia when he was not as up to snuff as he was on something like The Wild Bunch or Junior Bonner, um, I think those are still just uh, fantastic films. That is uh, really all four of those that I mentioned. But um, and, and Straw Dogs especially, I think was definitely. Um, I don't know if I like that more or less than Alfredo Garcia. Maybe a tiny, tiny, tiny bit less. But it's ultimately apples and oranges. They're two different kinds of films going for two, two different types of messages. And the book does go it does talk briefly about um, some of the misinterpretations that his films kind of uh, garnered from the public. How he was labeled uh, various kind of words. Uh, you know that he didn't. That he uh, you know just his films just weren't that. They were far more insightful and and making far more intellectual comments about society about violence about masculinity that a lot of these films these are uh, people who would watch them on a very kind of surface level were just only seeing the carnage and we're only seeing something far less um substantial which is why you know the book uh, uh makes makes a great point of going from a film like straw dogs in 1971 to immediately jumping into a film like junior bonner from 1972 which is so different but also fantastic in its own right junior bonner is a really excellent film and has one of my favorite moments in any film ever when there's a bar fight happening and all of a sudden the Pledge of Allegiance starts playing, and all the uh, patrons of the bar, they stop their fighting so they could uh, pledge their allegiance. It's, it's one of the most memorable sequences and that I've seen in a film. But I would highly recommend this book, um, Peck and Paw, If They Move, Kill Them. Oh, I'm sorry, If They Move, Kill Them, The Life and Times of Sam Peck and Paw. It's, uh, you know, it's a nice, weighty book. If you're a fan of him, it's required reading, and I think um, a portrait and montage, if that's the one that the other book had mentioned, that will be read at some point, but there is so much to read. I mean, I've said before, I have a stack of books in the other room, I just have to get through all of them, and um, another book that is going to be what I want to talk about here, we get a sip of this beverage, and then I can talk some about it. Um, was one that I had mentioned a few episodes ago by an uh, author, musician, uh, notable figure, Peter Sotos. I mentioned a little while ago I was at a convention, and I found this book, and I I hesitated for just a moment. I was like, you know what, man, I don't know, it's a little pricey, but at the same time, actually it was, it was fairly priced for the condition and even having an autograph in it. But I was saying that I thought, you know what, man, the work of Peter Sotos is very limited. It's very expensive that if you, you know, you come across a lot of it, you just got to jump on it. So I did. So I've been reading. I'm only about a quarter of the way through, so I really don't want to say too much just yet. I'm going to come back to this after I finish this book. But it's uh, from Peter Sotos and Jamie Gillis. <coughs> this book, Pure Filth, from copyright. Um, this is, pull that up right here. Copyright 2012 from Feral House. And this is... Pull this up here. So this was a limited book. I don't know how many copies there were of this. I think all of Peter Soto's stuff is limited. I mean, a limited run, that is. It's not um, sort of... 
commonly reprinted. But anyways, so I, I mentioned this board briefly a couple episodes ago, but it's, uh, we have transcriptions from, it seems like Jamie Gillis's, let me get the chapters here, a lot of, uh, for the most part, his On the Prowl series with introductions. Uh, so yeah, you have On the Prowl, Back on the Prowl, 2 and 4, um, Walking Toilet Bowl 2, Brown on Ebony, More Bad Girl Handling, uh, Humiliation of Heidi, Africa Interview, and Eve, with introductions from uh, Gillis on many of the sections. I'm only at the point now of, let me see here, Back on the Prowl 4, Part 1. Uh, so... I'm reading through the transcripts of that now, and it's, uh, it's a, a very, very fascinating book. I think uh, Peter Sotos himself is such an interesting guy and is such an interesting writer, the way that his uh, writings sort of uh, have a whole kind of life of their own in a way where you can kind of he, – he's very much a writer with his own sense of – his own personality. You really see how he can get from very intellectual, very um, – in depth and thoughtful writing to uh, I would I wouldn't quite say rambling but definitely uh, seems like a train of thought uh, sort of aggressive writing very un PC very uh, uh, ugly sort of writing in a in a very interesting way Peter Sotis is somebody who is who you know has a lot of very fervent um, detractors and people who love his writing you know I I can't necessarily judge the content of too much of his work seeing as how this is the only the first real book of his that I've read, even though it's only partially his as much as it is Jamie Gillis's. I mean, he, I mean, the transcriptions are from the On the Prowl series as well as some of his other work, but what I mentioned before is that um, there are introductions from Gillis on each of the sections talking about some of the women that were involved in that section of the uh, uh, episode. And there were two portions I did want to read that I uh, wanted to mention up here, this is how unprofessional I am, is that, bear with me for a second. Uh, there it is, I got that page right there, and the other one I wanna get, Okay, yeah, there's two sections I want to talk about here. And normally, I don't, like to get, I don't really want to talk about these out of context. I do think context is important. There was another thing I want to talk about that Sotos wrote that I thought was interesting, but I can't for the life of me find it because he has very long paragraphs, and trying to skim them can be trying to find a specific point that I was I was uh, wanted to refer back to uh, was just too uh, uh, tiresome. I just knew I wasn't going to come across. I wasn't spend all day trying to find it for the sake of this. But I want to mention two things, like Jamie Gillis said. The first works being that uh, it says here that in a three-part article he wrote for Screw, Screw Magazine, in January 1988, Jamie complained about the then-current state of his barely chosen livelihood. And to quote Jamie here, it has become increasingly difficult to... Oh, I should also say that if, you know, there's got to be some... Uh, there's got to be at least some language here, so if you are uh, don't want to hear about some of the more explicit stuff, then, uh, you know, you might want to skip ahead a little bit or maybe just skip the episode altogether because it's going to be some very uh, adult topics I'm going to be talking about here. But anyways, man, it says here, it, uh, it was becoming increasingly difficult to take any pride in the work. There were now no more filmmakers, only producers of jerk-off material. The original producers, men like Bob Wolf, were charting new ground, breaking down boundaries, but the present-day pornographer knows he is just a hack. We started as revolutionaries, became filmmakers, and ended up as whores. Looking at the state of pornography at that time, man, because, I mean, Jamie was, you know, all of the, I mean, he was just one of the prolific, I mean, he's, I mean, he's one of the Eric Edwards, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the Arbolas, the Harry Reams, you know, he's just very much a star of this kind of film, but he's also talking about moving into a new decade, a new, new sort of era, of a different kind of uh, adult film where they talk, oh, I always talk about, you know, at a certain point when he, when you don't need to go to a cinema to watch a dirty film or not, you can just rent them at a video store, uh, not even talking about bookstores or anything like that, but you know, you, they're, they're, they were less concerned of the actual content of the film and more so about what you could put on the box. And also as well, he mentions at one point, I don't know if it was in this book or in a different interview, but he mentioned somewhere that I 
completely agree with him on where he talks about that there were no more filmmakers of adult films, that there weren't anyone... I'm not, now this isn't me quoting him verbatim, this is kind of my own thing, but there wasn't anyone like a Gerard Damiano who was making very interesting, transgressive adult films. Uh, you know, I mean, Deep Throat being the biggest, but I'm talking about if you look at his other films, of course, The Devil Miss Jones, uh, Sex USA, uh, you know, uh, um, Memories Within Miss Aggie. I mean, he was a, he, he's the same way I look at like also uh, another filmmaker that Jimmy Gills worked with was Roger Watkins, who was, I guess, most famously known for House on, or, um, uh, Last House on Dead End Street, which very interesting uh, kind of horror film. But, you know, you look at his adult films like Corruption and, and Her Name Was Lisa. And you can, these are just guys who are actually trying to do something more with it, whether they realized it or not. I mean, uh, even just something like Her Name Is Lisa, not all the uh, sex in the film is, is, I think, entirely meant to titillate it. It can be very ugly at times, but I think that makes sort of more interesting films that way to have these sort of uh, transgressive sort of elements there of explicit, unsimulated sex. But there's one other part that I wanted to bring up here because I know I'm going to mess it up and forget. But uh, adding a little bit of context, so like I said before, is that he introduces each section with talking about some of the ladies that were um, uh, involved with the... Videos the On the Prowl, which, you know, um, but he talks about one here, which I'm going to paraphrase until I get to the actual paragraph that I want to find. But, uh, da, 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 da. some of the stuff I don't think I should say, but I'm trying to find the part. Uh, let's see here. So basically, he worked with this one girl uh, whose name was. This is me, you know, I probably should have had notes for this, but here I am trying to improvise on the spot to find specific names and specific sections. But, uh, maybe we'll come across it, I don't know. But one of the women that he worked with, who had sex with somebody they picked up from the adult bookstore that she was just not that interested with, she was very uninterested in, and they picked up somebody else, and she was far more attracted to that person. But, um... This last section here, introducing Back on the Prowl 2, Part 5, I guess I'll read this whole thing because it kind of gives a good idea of... Uh, Jamie, a lot of ways, is... The way that he writes is a lot of times like Peter, where uh, you can read his writing and you and it does make you wonder how sincere his writing actually is to the kind of person that he may be, whether or not this is just a, not necessarily a front, but how much is exaggerated or hyperbole or how much is sincere. There are times in Jamie's writings where I, I don't fully believe of his sincerity, but at the same time, the aggressiveness can, can sort of come out with some of his talks, like for example, you know, some of the transcripts, he says some really wild stuff in the heat of the moment, but then when he's talking to the guys, he's also very sincere and he's very tender with them. If a guy's having trouble performing, if you know what I mean, and I think you do, he's uh, very cool about it. He'll say like, oh, well, you know, you get farther than most guys, so that's all good and stuff. And uh, But anyways, the section I want to talk about here, what I was mentioning before is that, uh, let's get here. Okay. From page 99. We have, months later, I saw an interview with you where you stated that the black guy was a setup, that it was prearranged, but that Joe was not. Joe was the second guy that she had sex with. I was a bit heartbroken because I never set anything up, and I didn't want people to think that any of the prowls were faked. I ran into you at a video convention in Las Vegas and asked you if that was how you remembered that night, and you confessed that you only said that because you didn't mind the world knowing that you picked up a cute young white guy and got fucked but that the paunchy black cashier was another matter. You thought it made you look a little bit more respectable if he was at least someone we knew beforehand, rather than living proof of the fact that you might let yourself be fucked by anybody, anytime, anywhere. I was not angry with you for casting doubts on my integrity. I could never be angry with you, but I explained that I was still... Ah, I'm sorry. But I explained that I was still the only video guy who was actually going out and shooting live sex with total strangers, and that it was important to me to maintain my credibility and not be considered just another one of the gonzo video crowd. You apologize and promise never to speak falsely of me again. Now this last paragraph in particular is something I really wanted to highlight. You have since changed your name and are now billed the Cheyenne Silver. Sounds like strength and purity in wild Indians and horses in the Lone Ranger. You once told me your heart was on a farm with horses. I wish you well. I hope you get it, if you still want it, and that there will come a day when you no longer feel required to do anything that you are ashamed of. And that leads into the next section with Wildcat, which is her. And that section right there, I, I thought, particularly stood out because you have some of his writings, which... Um, 
can be interpreted with various levels of sincerity. But this one, I feel like, truly kind of gets that Jamie Gillis is a person where he does have two sides of him. You know, I, you can listen to him in interviews, and I'm not, by no means an expert or any of this. I'm just a fan, but I think there's a lot more going on there than just this front that he wants to push. You know, I think he was into a lot of this gonzo sort of stuff and wanted to push and, and just do really kind of transgressive, uh, wild things. But I see right. I, I read writings like that. And I, 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 I feel like there's more there than just the surface level kind of Jamie Gillis persona. But ultimately, I can't really say. I, obviously, I never knew the man, and he's since passed away. People closer to him would obviously have a much stronger perspective than I would. That goes without saying. However, I think that this sort of Gonzo pornography that he really kind of founded and started this sort of live, sort of sex stuff. I, I think there's more really to pull at from than just what I guess something like Boogie Nights would maybe maybe not necessarily interpret because I don't think that I I mean I think Paul Thomas Anderson is a brilliant filmmaker and I, I sincerely don't believe that's what he pulled from these videos is a sort of sleaziness I think he was able to to just take this kind of element into a new era and use it as a vessel to push the story, not necessarily commenting on On the Prowl as a series. Because if you watch the film, that sequence in particular is an intentionally uncomfortable. Whereas when you watch, you know, because I skimmed a little bit of the On the Prowl stuff. Actually, I was uh, reading a little bit of this and I had the video on at the same time to kind of get an idea of some of the dialect, some of the ways that uh, Jamie and all them would talk. Because ultimately, I mean, they're about an hour or so each. There's a couple of them. And it's going to take you goes without saying much faster to just read these you know just go through them kind of fast or go through them in a way that feels kind of natural whether or not that's actually how it was spoken you know i mean you watch them there's many pauses jamie's breathing a lot and and is moaning a lot into the microphone and stuff and, and it, it's it's much more there than just what you're reading on a page it, it's something a lot more going on if that makes sense um, but either way, I mean, I'm going to be probably finished with this book in not too long. I, I only started it fairly recently, and I'm already 100 or so pages in, man. It's, uh, it's wild. But uh, no, this is, I mean, this is just such a fascinating and really, really excellent book. And a big part of that is because, I mean, I love all the first section of Jamie talking, I'm sorry, of Peter talking about um his relationship with Jamie, his ideas, Peter not necessarily completely agreeing with all of what Jamie has to say, but sort of uh, his observations on a lot of uh, the societal kind of norms around a lot of this kind of taboo filmmaking and, and Jamie as a person, you know, they had a very, let's see, here. sorry, I'm trying to, I'm trying to find something while I'm talking, being completely unprofessional, but either way, yeah, no, this is just, the thing with a lot of his work is that I think a lot of his work is available as PDFs online, which is obviously not ideal to uh, read much in the same way. It's probably not ideal to watch a film on a computer. However, you know, it's much easier than paying X amount for an out-of-print book. But anyways, this will be... I'll bring this back up again when I get to the end of it. I don't know how many pages there are here. Um, let's see here. Get to the very last page. Yes, yeah, 329, and I'm on page 111, so I don't have that much more to go. I think I'll be done with this fairly soon. That Peck and Pop book took a while, though. That was about a month or so. That was a little, uh, little, like I said, a little under 600 pages. But with this book is that it's not, I don't know exactly what constitutes a coffee table book or not. I don't know what size it has to be, but either way, um, this is definitely a bigger book, but the transcripts of the uh, of the scripts and the, not even, I'm sorry, not the scripts, of the films themselves... Uh, you can really kind of run through these fairly quickly. But you also, you know, I'm reading this. Actually, I try to kind of get into the headspace of how they're going to be saying a lot of this, you know. And a lot of this, I uh, won't repeat here. But the way that, you know, they'll say a couple things back and forth, you can tell it's probably not too fast. It's sort of just like natural kind of back and forth. Uh, not just running through it like you would in a book where you're just, you know, it's just one line train of thought, you know what I mean? I don't know if I explained that well. Here here I am trying to explain something more while I'm trying to flip through here, me being unprofessional, but I'm gonna put this put this down for now because I'm gonna come back to this. Let's see here. So yeah, plenty plenty to go back into. Uh 
And yeah, man, I mean, the, the 1993 episode will be out later this week at some point. I've, I have a handful of nine more films to watch, that I gotta, and then i got to record, edit, pull the clips, put them all together, put it on Spotify, put it on YouTube. i got to get a Blu-ray episode out this week, so there's there's a lot to do. There's definitely no shortage of things to do, and I, you, know, you don't want to be wasting your time be sitting around talking about the things you're going to do and then never do them, man. That's just completely completely reductive and pointless it just there's nothing to it man that's just a wasted life right there not doing what it is that you you set out to do not making your hopes and dreams come true no matter what the situation might be or might what uh, might entail but uh anyways i think i'm gonna wrap it up right there a couple minutes early so i can get back to what i need to get back to just want to get this episode out later than i wanted it to wanted to have this out the other day but it's all a matter of what happens when and yeah all right we'll edit there all right well thank you for listening yet again be back next week next time with with a new blu-ray and a new top 10 episode all right i'm gonna cut off there